There's quite a few grey nurse sharks down there. Now, scientists and experts believe that the grey nurse shark will be extinct within seven years. And that's, that's a, a really big worry. Back in the early 60s, the grey nurse had a pretty bad trot. And that was from shark hunters, line fishermen, and the shark meshing program. And the numbers decreased drastically. And people then thought that they were a, a man-eater, along with the tiger and the great white. But now we know them as a placid shark, definitely not a man-eater. Now I've been diving for 53 years and I know the grey nurse well because I was back there in the early 60s when it all happened. I was part of it and I saw the demise of the grey nurse and I've searched and searched in all those years since for this vanishing grey nurse. Along the east coast of Australia, the grey nurse sharks congregate in selected gutters. Scientists say they may number no more than 300 and are plummeting toward extinction. Overseas, they're endangered too and are called ragged tooth sharks in South Africa and sand tigers in America. See that hook in its jaws? That's the shark's greatest threat today. It inhibits its feeding, and if lodged in the stomach, it's likely to die. Autopsies on 10 dead grey nurse revealed six had hooks in their stomach. At a grey nurse haunt off the New South Wales coast, I joined Dr Nick Otway of New South Wales Fisheries. He's capturing and tagging the grey nurse for scientific research. Um, keep pulling the shark through, pull it through to right through the end. Ooh. Look at those jaws. Okay, um, just give the drill a bit now. That's it, you've got, you've got the tissue sample now. Beauty, well done, that's good. Just give it a clip now. Yeah, that's good, that's well done, that's, it's gone. Yeah. All right here. Over. Grab it, tag if necessary. There he goes out. Okay, take measure. Okay. What, what's the um, what's the measurement? Two point four four. I'm taking the hook out now, so you guys get back, get clear. Um, here we go. Okay. Bye bye. Here we go. Best of luck. So you're taking a tissue sample. Yeah, it's a tissue sample for DNA analysis, and uh -huh. I'll be preserving that in alcohol. One of the advantages of um, this DNA sample will be, in the future, we can actually use it, to, uh, compare this to tissue we take from, say, for a fin, from a fin shark, to see whether or not that actual fin has come from a grey nurse shark. So what you're getting at, Nick, is if someone goes and catches a grey nurse and comes into a fish and ship shop and says, you know, here's a bit of wobbegong, uh, you can go along, test the meat, and know precisely that it's not Wobby, it's Grey Nurse. The shark is caught by a diver feeding it a baited hook. It's dragged to the stretcher, an unwilling patient. The tagging program is really vital because it'll give us information on the migratory movements and also localised movements 
and a fundamental importance, it'll give us an estimate of the total population, that is the total population along the east coast. In 10 surveys of 57 grain earth sites in New South Wales, Nick counted only 292 sharks. That is low. He relies on the support of sport divers to later report these tagged sharks. The grain earth has really had a bad trot in the last 50 years and part of the blame is its own physical makeup. Now it ha has a really nasty set of teeth, ragged and curved and in an aquarium where people view it, it has this habit of opening and closing its mouth and they can see these teeth and they look at it and say, wow, I wouldn't like to be bitten by this shark. The grey nurse became known as a killer unjustly because of a very famous murder case. Back in 1935, a tiger shark was caught off Sydney and placed in the Coogee Aquarium. It was over four metres long and this was Anzac Day and lots of Sydney siders came to view this magnificent specimen. But they got more than their money's worth. To their horror, the shark disgorged a human arm and it floated on the surface with a piece of rope attached to the wrist. The arm had a distinct tattoo and that allowed the police to identify the arm to belong to a small-time crook called James Smith. His accomplice, Patrick Brady, was charged with the murder the police had a prime witness, Reginald Holmes, but he was shot dead the night before the court inquiry. Bradley was acquitted because his lawyers argued that an arm did not constitute a dead body and that James Smith, minus his arm, could still be alive. The murder was front page news for weeks. The shark, a killer that helped to cover up a perfect crime. The tiger died shortly after because they don't live very well in aquariums and it was replaced with a big female grey nurse shark. All of Sydney knew about the murder and they came to Coogee Aquarium to view the famous shark. Now what they saw was a grey nurse shark with ugly raking teeth and they said, wow, look at those teeth, that's a killer. And that bad reputation stayed with the grey nurse for a long time. In 1962, I began making shark hunting films. In fact, the first film I worked on was called Shark Hunters. Now in those days, I just used an ordinary spear gun and invariably I didn't kill the shark and I had a pretty good fight on my hands. I had no qualms then about killing them because like everyone else, I thought they were man-eaters. In fact, the press and the people would say, the only good shark is a dead shark. Sydney was having a spate of shark attacks then and everyone was hyped up on sharks. Those early films on shark hunting were an enormous success and televised throughout the world. In 1963, I helped design an explosive head. Now this was the catalyst that virtually sent the grainless shark into extinction. It used a 12 gauge cartridge and on the end of a hand spear, it was devastating. Another dive improved on my design, and this is the one, a 303 explosive head. Now that's an army issue cartridge, and here we have a movable firing pin. So that when it's all screwed together and used on a spear gun because it's so small, when it hits the shark, the firing pin comes forward, strikes the cap, and blasts that charge into the shark. Now this opened up an entirely new world to the average diver because used on a spear gun, you didn't have to get so close to the shark. And virtually any spear fisherman could go out and kill a shark. And the poor old grain nurse, he copped it the worst. In fact, I can remember at Seal Rocks one day, we killed 22 grain nurse just in one day when we were making a film called Shark Safari. And no one really cared. We all regarded the shark as a killer and we felt that we were doing a service to the community. In the early 60s, the newspapers were full of reports of sharks scaring people out of the water or uh, large sharks being caught off Ben Buckler or in Sydney Harbour every weekend. So as one of the early skin divers, we were anxious to find some sort of defence 
against sharks. Uh, they were very little understood creatures in those days, but uh, when the first uh, shotgun powerheads were devised, uh, we experimented uh, on grey nurse on one occasion in very deep water at Montague Island. Uh, we found the grey nurse to be very docile, but um, uh, the experiments were only over one or two days. Ron Taylor was doing the filming. This was the only time I ever uh, had anything to do with killing grey nurse, but uh, later we concentrated on the whalers and tigers. But uh, Looking back at it, I think it started a trend that uh, ultimately led to the de demise of the grey nurse. About a year later, in 1964, I got tired of the killing, especially with the grey nurse. It just seemed senseless. In all my observations, I was seeing it as a docile shark, definitely not a man-eater. I guess the grey nurse's teeth were their downfall. I mean, these ugly, raking teeth made them look like a killer. But those teeth are just for catching fish, not chomping and tearing like a tiger does. Since my shark hunting films were continuing to be popular, they inspired divers to become shark hunters. And so the killing continued right up to the end of the 60s. Where we once saw a dozen or more grey nurse in their favourite gutters, now we were lucky to see one or two. And that lone shark would take fright and immediately we got close. In that year of 64, I discarded my spear gun and took only a camera, concentrating on filming the ocean giants. This was a natural progression, an important change. I found more delight in swimming with a great wild shark than hunting sharks. Us wildlife documentary makers have influenced people to change their attitudes towards wildlife. By mid-60s, all our films had a strong conservation message. Now I'm sorry for all this shark killing. In fact, I truly wish that we'd never designed the explosive head in the first place. Because I feel that, well, the shark is a beautiful, streamlined creature. He fits in well in the environment. He's not really interested in us. And I feel that, well, even this shark has a right to live. We had changed, and slowly the public's attitude changed too. Soon hunting was totally unacceptable, just like it is today. The plight of the vanishing grey nurse was as serious as the whale. By the end of the 60s, both were close to extinction. Whaling was banned in Australia in the late 70s, and the whales have rapidly come back. In 1984, another landmark decision was made. The grey nose shark was granted the dubious honour of becoming the world's first protected shark. Even the great white shark, the horrifying monster of jaws that terrified the daylights out of most people, would be protected a decade later. Along our popular surfing beaches, is a shark meshing program. I was there at Kira Beach in Queensland in 1963 when the meshing was first introduced. And guess what they caught? Lots of grey nurse and great whites in the winter months on their normal migration north. Even though there are fines in place of up to $220,000 and two years jail for deliberately killing a grey nurse shark, the government contracted meshing program does it deliberately and legally. It's ironic that my old shark hunting films now give Dr Nick Otway valuable scientific data. This is at uh, Seal Rocks and we caught about 22 grey nose sharks and dragged them up in the well, beach. You want to stop there for a moment? Yes. We can take the size of somebody, one of these people here when they come into a picture, mm -hmm. into view, and then we'll be able to use that to scale the sharks. We'll also be able to look at the sex of the sharks, so male, female, and work out a sex ratio, and we can compare that footage, uh, so shot in the 60s, compared to the similar sort of patterns that we're seeing in, you know, in the recent surveys. Well, at least our old shark hunting days has come into some scientific use. Will I go on? Yeah, please do. Stop. What do you see in that? 
It's a very large female and the other sharks that uh, I saw in the footage there were also females. So we're again we're seeing a predominance of females and if this footage is actually shot on the south coast that's probably consistent with the information that we're getting in more recent surveys. Grey nosed sharks have large stout bodies, a pointed snout and their two top dorsal fins are of equal size. Their colour is bronze and juveniles display dark spots. They grow to three metres. The jaws can distend outward and contain a formidable array of long, spear-shaped teeth. If you get this close, males are easily identified by their pair of claspers. These hook into the female to fertilise her eggs. When mating, the male uses his teeth to hang in there. Old females are heavily scarred from mating and pupping every two years. A strange twist happens in her reproductive cycle. The first of many sharks born inside the female immediately devours its brothers and sisters. It's called intrauterine cannibalism. Only two sharks emerge, one from each uterus. Can you imagine a mother feeling her cannibal baby chomping away at its siblings inside her? It's as wild a world when outside, for other big sharks will eat them. At the Port Stephens Fisheries Centre, Nick Otway does an autopsy on a juvenile grey nurse. OK, I'm going to take the stomach out now for dietary analysis. First, to do that, I'll put the ribbon around it, tie it off so we don't lose anything. Um, there we go, I'll just cut that now with the scissors. OK, we'll need to bag that. OK, I'll go on now and take the liver out. Um, the liver is also used as a buoyancy organ because it contains, contains lots of oils. And we've got, you can see, two lobes of the liver. And we'll need to bag that as well. Thanks, Mike. There you go. It's amazing how much you can learn by cutting up a shark. And I'll now take uh, a piece of muscle and we'll use that for DNA analysis, same as the tissue we've got out of the fins when we're tagging them. And we'll need to uh, put that into alcohol, please. And we'll also freeze a piece of that, so you need to cut some of that. We're going to take the vertebrae out now. And I'll cut it out. And what we're doing is taking about 10 vertebrae out from underneath where the first dorsal fin is. And we use this to age the shark. And uh, the, the growth rings you see in the tree, similar thing in, in the vertebrae of the shark, and we can use that to age the shark. It's hard to believe. You can tell the age of this shark just by the rings around that vertebrae. Ocean World Manly offers the public an ultimate experience to get up close and personal with their grey nurse sharks. No experience is required. Diver Nino Cunanan is taking Katie Weir down to meet the shark for her very first time. Understandably, Katie's a little nervous. All right, let's get in. Face mask allow them to talk to each other. How do you feel? Pretty scared at the moment. They're really close and um, they just, I don't know how they kind of feel like they're circling around us. Yeah, they just usually come and check us out because that's just the area where we do the feeding. Are you sure they know I'm not food? Definitely. These guys only feed and then fish and then squid and lobsters and a small prey like that. They're just so, so intimidating when they come close. Definitely. Yeah, they're pretty impressive, aren't they? Yeah. Sharks discard teeth like toothpicks. Hundreds more are lined up in rows, ready to move forward. All right. 
The Sydney Aquarium also offers shark dives and a spectacular feeding session. A daily adrenaline chore for David Watts. The sharks could be anywhere at any, st at any stage. And of course, you've only got that much view. So you're, you're, pretty, you're pretty incapacitated underwater. Because they're very close. Yeah. Well, they, they are, yeah. They're, they're big animals. There's not much space down there for them. So you, you, you really have to you know, know what you're doing. So David, have you been bitten? Um, I haven't myself. I've actually bumped into the sharks when I, when I came up in the water column and that's something that we've got to be very careful of. Never to come up straight in the water, just to, to come up in an angle. Um, the other day, uh, one of the guys did get bitten on the head. It, it's an accident. The sharks never do it on purpose. Um, but he just finished feeding one shark. Another, another animal came in. Um, obviously thought he still had the fish and, and just bit him on the head. I'm, I'm not much damage. I'm noticing that, that when the sharks actually smell that, that fish and start to get excited, they drop down a bit lower, about waist level. They, they do, they do, and that's something we've got to be careful of too. If the sharks are a bit too excited, then we get out of the way because, yeah, yeah they're pretty quick. My son Dean is going down to film the feeding. There have been only four attacks by grey nurse, and all happened in an aquarium when feeding them. These sharks are just coming in from everywhere. Oh, that's it. He definitely wanted it that time. It's actually quite eerie in here with all these sharks cruising by. They're not really that interested in the fish at the moment. I guess they've, they got fed well last time. Oh wow, look at the way of the jaws distend out. That giant black ray is really, really having a go at that diver. I think he's trying to eat his hood. When I was asked to capture grey nurse alive for aquariums back in the 60s, I went out with a spear gun and simply dived down and speared them in the fleshy part of the body, being careful not to hit a vital spot. When I look back at that primitive method, I'm surprised that all those sharks did live a long life in captivity. In 1973, Bob Webb and Bill Hookway trialled a better life capture method. It's a lasso. A rope loop clipped to an aluminium ring is slipped over the shark's head and the rope pulled tight. The grey nurse naturally struggles to get free and is slowly pulled to the surface so that air can escape from its stomach. Grey nurse are the best sharks to display in aquariums. They live long and are mean looking. Unbelievably, they were once listed the fourth most dangerous shark with 60 attacks. The fault lay in poor observation and media hype, a case of mistaken identity around the world. In those early days, we only went down to spear fish, not to observe. Fish were plentiful and big. When the killing stopped, I did begin to observe. To my delight, I found grey nurse to be like giant puppy dogs, their vicious appearance giving way to a placid, gentle nature that should not be provoked.
We were still gung-ho and foolishly went down at night in the hope of filming them feeding. I'm on South Maruba Beach and not far away, about 10 k's, is the heart of Sydney, the Opera House, the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And just beyond that headland is Bondi, Australia's most famous surfing beach. And out here behind me, that's called Magic Point. And only 300 metres from here, 16 metres down, is a school of grey nurse sharks. Now in the past, any grey nurse that wandered in here would be a dead grey nurse but now they feel safe and they're coming home. See you down there, Dean. The Ride Underwater Club brings Dean and I to Magic Point. Paul and Alan are our guides. When the anchor is secured, I communicate with Dean, who has a microphone in his full face mask. A large crowd gathers on Marubra Beach, drawing media attention to the plight of the endangered grey nurse. Their plan is to transport the 15 metre PVC shark beyond the surf to be held up by swimmers, if it gets through. Shark dives are big business now. Even though the sea is rough, pro dive skipper Philip Hawley has an excited group on board. Okay, Ben, here we are at uh, Magic Point, mate. Listen, uh, we're going to put the uh, anchor in next to the cave to the left-hand side. And what we'll do is uh, we'll scoot across the cave. We've seen up to about 18 sharks, but just recently they've been a little bit scarce. Yeah. <laughs> The sun comes out as I swim toward the cave. There's a heavy swell running. I see something new since my previous dive, a weedy sea dragon. This tendency to aggregate the key sites makes the species vulnerable to localized pressures. Two of these sharks have hooks in their jaws. There is no evidence scuba divers are causing a decline in their numbers. The New South Wales government has given partial protection to 10 critical grey nurse sites, including this cave, their home, here at Magic Point in the heart of Sydney. Wow, that was amazing! <laughs> Sharks, cuttlefish, octopus. What can I say? Last time I was here, I uh, went diving at the site and uh, got bitten by a wobbegong. I was actually 
unprovoked. Uh, I think he decided I didn't taste very good. <laughs> The tagging program has definitely shown um, that the, sh the shark undergoes quite substantial migratory movements. In uh, the winter months it tends to move north and in the summer months when the waters are warmer down south, down in southern New South Wales, it moves further south. Uh, when it's moving north during the winter period it uh, tends, it, you have sharks pupping and you also have mating occurring and then the males tend to move off separately away from the females um, and in some parts they tend to disappear for some period of time. We see a few of them but not as many and at that stage we don't really know what's going on with the males but uh, hopefully more sightings of the tag sharks will hopefully answer some of those um, questions that we still have at the moment. Other large marine creatures also migrate north to Queensland in the winter. The Great White humpback whales minky whales even the tiger shark moves north to turtle nesting sites The most spectacular is huge shadows of baitfish on the move past the Gold Coast. They attract sharks in their hundreds. I wonder if this board rider is ignorant of all the sharks beneath him. He must be. He's dangling his legs. Now here's an exciting sport. Chasing sharks away on a jet ski. The grey nurse migrate into Queensland to six sites. Carly, I understand that uh, you, along with the uh, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, are going to protect the grey nurse habitats out here? What we're doing at the moment is going through a process of assessing the key threats to the grey nurse shark at identified key aggregation sites for them mm. here in Queensland. And then we'll go through a normal process of talking to the community and all the stakeholders and working out what is the best way both for the shark and the community to protect them from these key threats to the critical habitat. We obviously understand that the population is critically low and for example at the moment at Flat Rock we're seeing numbers between say 10 and 20 and a lot of them have got fishing tackle attached to them and currently a lot of them are very mature females which are pregnant so we do have some immediate concern as to reduce key threats from them. Well that sounds good, I'm glad to see that's happening. This is Wolf Rock off Double Island Point and this is really the northern extremity of the grey nurse migration when they come north in the winter. They actually stay here then turn around and head back south. But surprisingly there's a permanent population here and we don't really know why. Maybe it's the cold current just happens to come in here at Wolf Rock but we'll soon find that out. Wolf Rock Dive Centre has brought me here. From out of the gloom glides one shark, then two. It languidly turns a metre away. It's a buzz to confront this shark and now I'm briefly the centre of its attention. See the parasite on its fin. This is Flat Rock here off Point Lookout and that's just east of Brisbane. And this is a favourite place for the grey nurse to come in the winter months. It's August now and providing they 
survive the shark nets down the Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast, they're pretty safe here. And Dr. Nick Otway and SeaWorld are going to go down and they're going to noose these sharks. And so they can put tags on them and then see where those sharks go from here. A large ray leads my son Adam and I into the gutter where the sharks congregate. The Queensland Government has just announced total protection of this flat rock site, Wolf Rock and two more between. All fishing is banned, with fines up to $225,000. Dr Nick Otway, Carly Bansima and Trevor Long of SeaWorld prepare to catch and tag the flat rock sharks. The same lasso invented back in 1973 is being used. A specially designed Perspex tube is a new addition. I can see about a dozen grey nurse. The shark wranglers get ready. This is where the Perspex tube comes into play and it's not easy guiding the shark inside. Snug as a rug with minimum impact, the corralled shark is hauled to the surface. If you dive here, you can take the ropes to gap. Nick's taking no chances. That's a stainless steel sleeve he's putting on. Primarily we're looking at tagging the animal, then we're taking some length measurements, and, um, and then some photographs, and then back in the water. This is probably uh, the most sharks I've seen in the gutter for at least 15 years, which is a wonderful sign. So. Yep. So these are the holodromids that we use for DNA work. Point, what did you say? 2.50. Point we store it in 100% alcohol. Well, what we're going to do is compare pop the population on the west coast with the population on the east coast and also compare it to grey nose shark populations in South Africa and North America and hopefully if we can get samples from South America as well. I counted 11 in the area of my field of vision. Um, I've been diving here since around about 1970 and in the 70s there, there were a lot more. That, was, that would be a reasonable number in the 70s. Numbers drop right back to where we saw, you know, probably mid late 80s, early 90s, and that animals drop numbers drop right back to probably twos and threes. So this is quite good for me, having been here for a number of years, to see this many in the gutter, so that's great. Brian, who's taking the winch? You take this, Gav, I'll take the winch. Pull down on the head! The operation is a success. The next sighting of these tag sharks may be down the New South Wales coast. A week later, another research vessel anchors a flat rock with CSIRO scientist Barry Bruce, who is going to track the grey nurse. This is the transmitter we'll be putting on the shark. The little arrowhead sits underneath the skin, and the shark tows this along. This float helps keep the, the tag itself 
off the body of the shark so that the tag doesn't bang against the shark and annoy it. But the, the, uh, the really tricky part is that not only do we want the shark to wear this tag so we can track it for periods of 24 hours or so, but we want the tag to come off the shark. This little link corrodes through at a, after about 40 hours and floats to the surface. A surprise visitor is a humpback mother and calf. Divers, this is topside. Can you just sit up on the ledge, a bit shallower for five or so minutes and we'll get back to you and let us know if you see any sharks. Um, nothing to be sighted as yet. Copy that, no sharks sighted as yet. Fish bait is laid out and the shark soon appears. The transmitter with an acoustic pulse is on the end of the hand spear. The diver must move in close to implant it. Well the good news is we finally got a shark tagged and now comes the challenging part, we've got to be able to follow it around. And the way we do this is with, with both vessels, we're on the, the big vessel at the moment, with our tracking pole down on the, uh, on the outside of the boat. And that comes up to our deck unit, which feeds all the information to our computer, where, as you can see, we're currently logging what the shark's up to. So we've got here a, a, a readout of the shark depth, and every so often you'll see we'll come up with a GPS position that just tells us where we are. Uh, so basically, the pole is moved around and given a general direction. We take a compass bearing. Uh, that tells us how far away the shark is by the strength of the signal and exactly where the shark is with the compass bearing. Because uh, we're on such a larger boat, we can't actually get that much closer to the animal. Uh, that's why we're also using the smaller boat in conjunction with this one. Sharks can go hiding <laughs> very easily within rocks and also within coral structures as well. If you do happen to lose a shark, they can be quite difficult to pick them back up again. Well, so far it's early days in terms of what we learned from the tracking of this particular shark. At the moment all it seems to be doing is cycling up and down the gutter where we tagged it, which is kind of typical behaviour. But what we're hoping to see later on in the evening is that the shark will become more active, it'll start swimming a little bit faster, and perhaps after, after nightfall we might see it leave this particular area, leave the gutter, and go off on a forage looking for food away from from uh, Flat Rock and that's exactly the source of information that, that we're trying to find out about their movement patterns. What we're doing at the moment is the implementation of the recovery program. The first week we spent out here tagging five sharks with individual identification tags and this week we're actually tracking two sharks and under the recovery program we basically need to learn a lot more about these sharks annual migration patterns and daily migration patterns. The grey nose shark has a, a fundamentally um, a biological uh, constraint that um, restricts the animal to producing only two pups every two years. Now this means that um, the population can continue to grow only when there is um, natural mortality. The sources of natural mortality could be other sharks, things like that. Any human induced mortality causes the population to start declining. And with our influences over the past uh, 50 years or so, the populations are obviously going backwards and declining um, to low levels. Now, the animal needs to overcome this by having reduced levels of mortality. If it doesn't, the animal certainly can um, decline to a level where it will approach extinction. Seal Rocks is a sleepy village and the local fishermen are quite angry the government has banned fishing around this largest grain earth site. This village has been here maybe since the early 40s and it's remained the same since then. We've fished traditionally here and we've never gone out of our way to do any environmental damage at all to anything. Um, the travelling season, the, the fish come in uh, April, May, uh, which is beach fall here on the beach. Uh, they haven't, they've just uh, made that another restricted fishery. We have stayed in tradition and try to survive, but it's just impossible. 
We've all gone to the wall. I mean, I only just do it for something to do now, just a day out. In 1985, uh, the toilets went a bit high tech here, and where they never ever come inside all this pristine, beautiful uh, trapping grounds, they came in with their otter boards and chains and literally ripped the bottom of the ocean up. Took all the coral, gravels, uh, the, they've made it a desert out there really, where before you'd, you'd always go out and get your six, seven boxes of snapper, now you count the fish on your hand, it's, it's a shame really. When I first started here there were schools of up to 80 to 100 grey nurse shark at the big and little rock and then in 85 too the divers come along, the commercial di uh, diving schools from Foster and Port Stephens and they're taking up to 300 people a day out with flash cameras and spotlights uh, and all the sharks disappeared. Well they tried to turn it on us saying that we'd killed all the sharks. I mean as I said They've been there for years and years and years. I mean, there was no way that we'd even set a line to kill a grain of shark. The seals at Seal Rocks have also disappeared. Well, they do come and go. I mean, every year when they're travelling up the coast, they, they, they gather out at the big rock and the little rock. Not as many as they used to be, but you might get half a dozen or so that hang around for a little while and then they move on. Because really, there's no food here for them. As I say, there's no bonito, there's no kingfish. That's a long light boat out there it's taking all the bait fish in this area. From Port Stephens to Foster, they burly up all the headlands and take all the mackerel, bonito, any fish that they burly up goes for bait. And they suppose they get 3,000 baits at a time and 3,000 every week or so is just completely devastated the whole area. I filmed this healthy colony of seals back in the 60s their numbers strangely dwindled until there were none. In competition for the fish, the seals came off second best. Dean and I are on the dive foster boat at Seal Rocks. I've not dived here since my shark hunting days and I anticipate big changes. Stay close to the bottom. They have got teeth they can bite. There's quite a big aggregation here. There might be 40 or 50 sharks in the scatter. Don't wave your hands around. Keep your hands by your side. Yeah, in the early days you could come here and uh, any of these gutters would have 40, 50 sharks in them. And over, went to a period probably in the last 10 years where the numbers have just decreased, where some years we've really been scratching to find sharks here at all. I would say a lot of it's to do with the uh, commercial fishing here. We had uh, often found long lines here, or, or short lines actually, 10, 12 hooks with uh, uh, set baits. That's all, that's all gone now. Uh, over the last five years that's all stopped and we're just gradually now seeing an increase in numbers. I believe there's quite a lot of grey nurse down here. Last time the divers were out here, they counted 82. And that was at Seal Rocks here and at Little Seal Rocks a little bit further over. So I hope it's going to be the same. I'm pleased to see a lot of sharks down here and even a school of yellowtail they can feed on. Sadly, the latest news is not good. Dr Otway has calculated in his latest scientific paper that if the grainers population is indeed 300 with a known 12 fatalities a year, of which 75% are females, then quasi-extinction will occur in 13 to 16 years. Now if these fatalities are actually higher, and this is very likely, then quasi-extinction will occur in six to eight years. I can see that's a hook in the shark's jaw. New South Wales Fisheries is now revising their current protection with further restrictions on fishing. There's probably about oh, 55, 60 sharks in there at the moment. Not as many as last week. We've probably had the biggest aggregation I've seen for oh, maybe five or six years. There was probably 120 down there last week.
whatever they call the gutter down there, full of sharks. It's brilliant. Unreal, mate. Unreal. Never seen anything like that. A little bit scary, I would say. Just a little bit. <laughs> People come back on board just like that hooting and hollering and <laughs> it's quite a buzz. Some of those people have never dived with sharks before, you know, and then the next bit you put them in the water with 30 or 40 sharks all around them. <laughs> no wonder they react. Wow, there's a lot of grey nose sharks down there. I counted about 40. Now that's as as many as back in the old shark hunting days. The grey nurse have come home to seal rocks, just like they've done at the Magic Point at Maroubra. But this school of grey nurse down here probably represents 50% of the population in New South Wales because they're not really coming back to the other haunts. Protection is vital, not just for the species, but the habitat as well. That's why they've come back to seal rocks, because it's a safe place to be. Now, maybe the scientists are right in saying that the species will be extinct in seven years. Maybe they will endure and come back in sufficient numbers as they appear to be now. I hope so.